Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the City of Delray Beach's regular commission meeting scheduled for Tuesday, May 16th, 2023 at 4 p.m. Please call the roll. Mr. Frankel. Present. Mr. Long. Present. Mr. Bolston. Present. Ms. Burns. Here. Mayor Petrolia. Here. And please stand for the pledge. Okay, any additions, deletions, or substitutions to the agenda? Yes, ma'am, Madam Mayor. Yes, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. We need to remove items 6D and 6E from consent agenda. 6D as in dog and E? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And 6G, we need to move to regular okay. agenda item. So that'll become um, 7AA? Sure. And actually, speaking of regular agenda item, 7A, as it currently is positioned, should also be removed from the agenda as well. Okay. doke. Anything else um, from anyone else? I do have, I wanted to remove, um, well, first of all, I wanted to ask that we move forward 7D to uh, 7, let's call it 7A, since A is missing now, um, because there is a, a um, the representative has a prior engagement and needs to get out of here as quickly as possible. It should be very quick. So let's move that to 7A. And then also I wanted to ask that we have just a conversation, quick one on 6M. Can we make that 7BB? Okay, so 7M will become 7BB. Anything else? Seeing nothing, entertain a motion as amended. Motion to approve the agenda as amended. Second. Second. <laughs> Call the roll, please. Mr. Long. Uh, yes. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Burns. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Okay, we have two wonderful people in the audience we want to invite up. We have our legislative update coming from Senator Berman and uh, then uh, Representative Casillo. Thank you and welcome to both of you for being here. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Congratulations to the new Commissioners, Commissioner Burns, Commissioner Long, and um, welcome to everyone. So we're back in town. Um, the 60 most dangerous days in Florida ended last <laughs> Friday, and they were pretty dangerous. We I have survived. To, Good we for did, you. We did survive. Um, Lots of cultural war issues, which I'm sure you all have seen. Um, we spent a lot of time on that, and unfortunately, what it resulted in is missed opportunities <coughs> to discuss other things that affect people's pocketbooks. Um, we still have a major property insurance crisis, which I'm sure all of you are aware of. We did not do much. We passed one bill on that issue, and hopefully, We'll see, but I don't see property insurance rates going down anytime soon. We have a teacher shortage. Um, we have a health care cliff right now with a lot of people who are going to be coming off of Medicaid because the COVID emergency is done. Um, and then we have, uh, of course, our affordable housing issue, which we did address this session, which I'm really happy about. Um, we passed a bill, it was the priority of the Senate President, it's called the Live Local Act. It's got um, a lot of money for um, affordable housing for, for what's known as the SAIL program and the SHIP program. Um, we are, there's money, there's tax breaks um, and all sorts of things, but you should be aware that there are some things in there that could potentially affect development here in Delray Beach, um, particularly if you build in a commercial or industrial area and you put affordable housing in, you will be able to waive zoning and height um, restrictions. So. Um, we may end up having to go back and do a glitch bill on that issue depending on how it all works out, but um, just be aware of that. We had an unbelievable budget. Um, we have a $117 billion budget. Wow. Everybody voted for the budget. It was very robust. It's really good. I mean, our state is in good financial shape. Part of it is from the federal government. Of that $117 billion, about 41 is from the federal government. 
Um, and we did really wonderful things in the budget. We put a lot of money away for environmental projects, including the Everglades, the Indian River Lagoon, Springs, um, all sorts of items on that. We did raise the amount of how much we're funding for each student. Um, unfortunately, we're still woefully low in the list of 50 states about how much we fund for each student. Um, you know, the number I hear is that we're 48th out of 50th. I'm not sure if that's 100% true, but we are on the bottom end, but we did raise um, student funding. We also did increase insurance for children for the kid care program, which is really important because, as I mentioned, you're going to have all these people falling off of the Medicaid program and they'll be uninsured. Um, we did, again, to the city of Delray, again, did very well in the budget. I know last year you did really well. Um, I think I have, let me see, I think I have three or four projects that you got. Um, first is the Delray Beach Public Seawall Im Improvement for $1 million. The Delray Beach Historic Campus Drainage and Parking for 100000 The Lakeview Park Playground Improvements for $100,000. Oh, and then the teen center, which I was going to talk about, so I'm glad Nancy Channon's here too. Um, we got $250,000 for the EJS teen center. Um, really proud of that. Um, and if anybody has some good connections with the governor, including uh, on your projects also, um, I would be asking the governor not to veto these um, items because they're really important to the city and to the community, so anything anybody can do to put in a good word with the governor on those, that would be great. Um, we're hearing that the vetoes are going to come out fairly quickly this year, and we're also hearing that they're supposedly going to be light, but you never know <laughs> um, until everything happens, so anything you can do on, on those issues, that's really wonderful. Um, you have a great lobbyist. I thought he'd be here. He's usually here, Matt Forrest. Um, and he does a great job for the city, and I think that's partly, uh, you know, we owe a large part of the success to all his advocacy um, on behalf of the city. Um, so, uh, Rep. Casello is going to give you a little bit more about the preemption issues and the things that we did that that make your job a little bit harder. Um, but I'm always happy to represent the city of Delray Beach, and after Rep. Casello finishes, we're happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Good evening, Hello. Commissioners, Mayor. It's good to see you all. My first time here in the chambers. So, oh. Yes, it is. Wow. So, uh, due to the redistricting, uh, I'm now representing your city, and I'm proud to do that. Uh, like the Senator had said that, uh, you know, I, I guess one of the more important things that we do when we go to Tallahassee is try to bring money back into the communities. I mean, let's be honest with each other. That's that's why we're up there most of the time. So it was great. It, it's a team effort. Uh, it's uh, with the Senate side, with the House side, and with, uh, with, the, with Matt Forrest, who's like the quarterback of it all, uh, to get this thing done. And if you've ever seen how the budget's uh, appropriations works, it looks like a, a Black Friday at a Walmart where everybody's shoving papers into the silos of where their bills or appropriations are. Um, the Senator mentioned the, the, uh, the budget, $117 billion, uh, $41 billion of that came from our, our federal government, uh, which, which is good, you know, so we're, we're, as the governor would like to say, we are flushed with cash. Uh, in my presentation, I, I'm going to do a lot of reading here because the bills, uh, the, there was like over uh, 1,800 bills filed, 1,800 bills, you can imagine. Over a little over 200 were actually heard on the House, on the house floor and probably the Senate they side too. About 300. About yeah. 300, yeah. okay, about 300. So uh, once they get to the House floor or the Senate floor, there's usually a good, if they go through a committee process, uh, usually a three committee process uh, depending what uh, the subject matter is and if they survive the committee hearings uh, then they uh, if the chair of the Speaker of the House or the Senate president decides to put it on the agenda to be heard on the floor and then we can take a vote on it and uh, get it try to get passed and usually once they get that par far into the process it, it, it's usually successful but uh, with that being said uh, the uh, 
I'm going to read the bill numbers too, so if you can write them down if it's, if it's a point of interest for you. And we can come back and get a little more intimate with our details and everything like this. I know you pressed for time here. We, we, could, we spent 60 days up here. You know, we don't want to spend <laughs> half that much here. So uh, the, uh, I'm going to start off with uh, the issues here. The local government comprehensive plan. Uh, this was House Bill 359, Senate Bill 550. And this would allow for the capital improvement element of local comprehensive plans to have an option to modify administratively if all projects have been adopted by the project's appropriate board. Additionally, the bills amend language to allow for the prevailing party in a challenge to recover attorney fees and costs in challenging or defending a plan or a plan amendment, including reasonable appellate attorney fees costs. This bill also, this is the key word uh, when we do it, prohibits local government from enforcing any land development regulations other than those related to the density or intensity on any of the institutions within the Florida College system. So, right, <laughs> shaking, we can shake our heads a little bit on that, but uh, preempts you. Um, land use and development regulations. This was House Bill 439, Senate Bill 1604, uh, and in its current form, uh, revises and amends a variety of elements impacting local government comprehensive planning, as well as methodologies and data usage and planning period timeframes. The bills include local governments must comply with the special mass rate decisions where land use decisions were challenged by petitioners who were previously denied. Uh, chiefs of police. Uh, I thought I saw the chief. Chief? <laughs> this, this one's for you. Uh, this, is, um, this was House Bill 935, and what this bill does, this bill prohibits, prohibits, prohibits a municipality from terminating a police chief without first providing them written notice and allowing them the opportunity to offer a response at the next regular scheduled council meeting. The bill specifies that a municipality cannot waive or modify this requirement in a contract or include a non-disclosure clause that prohibits a police chief from responding to their termination. Chief, I hope we never have to practice that here, but mm -hmm. <laughs> it's there for you. Uh, another one here with the, the municipalities here, it's the municipality boundaries support, and this was Senate Bill 718, House Bill 653, and it specified that before starting annexation procedures, a local government shall prepare a feasibility study for the proposed area to provide needed clarification on the process of contriction. The bill requires the city to get permission from at least 50% of the owners in an area proposed to be de-annexed when more than 70% of the land is owned by individuals, corporations, or legal entities. Contraction means the reversion of property when municipal boundaries to an uncorporated status. That passed. And this one here is for all, all elected officials. This one's probably important because it's going to affect each one of us who, who are for office. And it's the final disclosure for elected offices. And this was House Bill 37, uh, Senate Bill 774. And what it requires all municipal mayors, city commissioners, elected members of the municipal governing body, and members of the State Commission on Ethics to file an annual full disclosure of financial interest, Form 6. That's Form 6 with the Florida Commission on Ethics. These individuals are currently required to file only a limited disclosure on financial interest, which is our Form 1 that we fill out. If this bill becomes law, and I think the governor has signed this, the Form 6 requirement would go into effect for elected municipal office officials on January 1st, 2024. So just keep that in mind uh, next time we're filing your, your uh, disclosures, financial disclosure. That would be pretty important. And. Uh, Another one that we have here is uh, the building construction uh, prohibit. I, I, I hate to preference these things, these bills, by saying prohibit. That it's the worst thing in the world. I come from local government uh, up there in Boynton Beach as a city commission, and any time preemption and prohibit, it, that's a terrible word to use in front of a commission. But anyway, this prohibits a local government from making substantive changes to building plans after a permit has been issued. If substantive changes are made after the permit is issued, 
the local government must identify the specific plan features that do not comply with the Florida Building Code, the Florida Fire Prevention Code, or the Life Safety Code, or any local amendments thereto. The specific code chapters and section upon which the changes request are based must be provided to the permit holder. A local fire inspector, plans review, or building official who fails to comply will be subject to disciplinary action. And this, this one here is a, is a good one here. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a lot easier to take the cities to court now uh, and uh, file lawsuits and stop any kind of a project until it's heard, goes through the courts. And, and this is what this is. This is Senate Bill 170. And uh, the bill grants attorney fees for successful challenges to the county, municipal, local ordinances are arbitrary or unreasonable. Arbitrary or unreasonable. Uh, you, we can each have a different opinion of what's arbitrary and what's unreasonable. Provides the reasonable attorney fees, costs and damages up to 50000 may be awarded to the prevailing plaintiff in any civil action challenging the adoption of a local ordinance on or after October 1st, 2023 that is arbitrary or unreasonable. Allows for consideration of a proposed ordinance to be pushed to the next meeting without any further public notice if that meeting is announced in the meeting and the consideration is included on the next agenda. This applies retro retroactively. Requires local government to prepare business impact statements before adopting certain proposed ordinances. If certain conditions are met, requires suspended enforcement and expedited court review of certain local ordinances whose validity is being challenged on the grounds that is expressively preempted by the Florida Constitution or state law or is arbitrary or unreasonable. And provides that an attorney's signature on legal filing constitutes affirmation that the lawsuit is not filed for certain improper purposes. It allows imposing sanctions for attorneys who violate that. And just a couple more, if, I, if you may. Uh, um, you know, we, we're here expressing this, and you can imagine sitting on the Senate floor or the House floor, and, and we hear these, you know, uh, sometimes 60, 70 bills at a time. And if you're not really paying attention, which we always don't always pay attention, it, you know, that's the truth, folks, uh, that you, you might miss something. But, you know, we go over this, and we have a great staff. I know uh, the senator has her staff, Evelyn, and I have my staff, Brian Bees. And if it wasn't for these people that work with us up there in Tallahassee, uh, we wouldn't be where we were. It would be just totally impossible for an individual to do it all on their own. But this one here is House Bill 1417, Residential Tendencies. This bill grants a full and complete preemption of all landlord tenant issues to the state, expressly overwrites any local government regulations on the screening process used by a landlord in approving tendencies, security deposits, rental agreements, application and fees associated with such applications, terms and conditions of rental agreements, the rights and responsibilities of landlord and tenant. Folks, this is a uh, anti-rent control pro-landlord and does nothing to get to the root of the housing crisis that the Senator had mentioned earlier. Uh, Palm Beach counties uh, have passed pro-tenant tenant ordinances, including a renter's bill of rights. This bill would take all of that away. Um, did you, did you, Senator, did you talk about the vouchers? No, I did not. Okay. I, I just, uh, just two more things if you, if you I was going to bring that up if you didn't. The vouchers. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, and, and here's the deal. Uh, we've um, obviously, as the Senator said, we, we give X amount of dollars to per student, and that's how it's uh, depending. The money follows the student. The money follows the student. Very good, Mayor. And this, and this plays a big part in this. And right now, it's, it's roughly $8,500. And what we have do is called a universal voucher. Universal voucher. That means every student, no matter where they go to school, even homeschool students, are entitled to a voucher of $8,500. So they can take that $8,500 and go to anywhere, any school, private, Catholic, Protestant, any kind of a, uh, religious school, um, or stay in a public school system and take that $8,500 with them and it leaves the public education fund. They draw it out of there, and it follows the student like you mentioned there. Um, and it, there's no cap on this as far as uh, gross income. So, uh, and I used uh, uh, analogy that uh, each, uh, when I was on the House floor that, uh, God, I mean, even Tiger Woods' kids could get this voucher, and uh, I, I did 
not get a call from Tiger Woods, but <laughs> it was mentioned. I shouldn't be mentioning names like that. So, <laughs> but uh, I get a call now. <laughs> yeah, right. but I, I think this is huge. Uh, I think this is a, a real big one that the, the money's following the student. Uh, I think it's going to have a vast impact on our public education, or as they like to call it in Tallahassee, government education. Yeah. Uh, it's it's yeah. it's sad to hear that. Um, <clears throat> And, and the last one I want to get, because uh, I, I make no uh, bones about this, uh, I'm a union card carrying guy. My dad was a union member. And uh, the governor, our governor, um, he had, a, he had a, a, an issue with one of the unions, uh, the school unions, OK? Uh, that's no secret here. It's been well documented in the papers. And uh, what it does, it prohibits the use of a paycheck uh, deduction for most public sector union dues and increases the 60% required employee membership, potentially decertifying a union if they can't meet that threshold. So what that means, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that anybody who's been having their union dues taken out of their paycheck, mm -hmm. like the United Way and everything else, we get taken out of our paychecks automatically. Um, this is not going to be the case for union members. Now, they did a carve out. They did a carve out for our first responders police, fire, correctionals, and, and the first responders. But what this means to you as a governing body of city, now your sanitation workers, your park workers, and uh, everybody else that works for the city that makes this great city what it is, uh, are not going to be able to have dues taken out of their, uh, out of their paychecks. Um, it's going to be a, a real issue. I know I've been talking to the Palm Beach County uh, Teachers Association. They've implementing a plan to try to get ahead of this before it's implemented and I would highly recommend that you talk to your union officials here in the city uh, and tell them that this is coming it's the law uh, and uh, we have to make uh, you know uh, something to do to, to take that place if that's what they uh, if that's what they so do but uh, you know um, once again uh, and just closing real quick it, it was not all Tallahassee's bad <clears throat> all right but what I get in the house is 120 of us in the house. Uh, we are a, there's a super majority across the aisle, folks, and a super majority in the Senate. And any time you have a super majority in any kind of government, it's not good government. It is not good government. It's not democracy, okay? You, you need both sides to give, to take, that gray area, the debating. They, they have no need to debate now. They, they, there's only 30, 35 uh, uh, Democrats in the House and only 12 in the Senate. They have super majorities in both houses and they own the Florida Supreme Court. So it's a difficult thing up there. Uh, so when we go up there, we fight hard. We've got a good team, the Palm Beach County delegation. We fight hard for all the cities. And I know the Senator and I, when, when we have con uh, constituents coming around, we don't ask if you're Democrat or Republican, or even if you live in a, uh, in a district. If you come into the office or call the office, we're going to help you. Uh, and that's what we're here for. And, uh, you know, we look forward to continuing to serve this great city here. Uh, our offices are always open. Uh, and uh, look at uh, the, some, of the, some of the bills that we put forward come from great minds like yourselves. You know, you, you think of an idea, say, look, this could help if we do this, this, and we get it up there in Tallahassee, put it in drafting, and hopefully we get a bill and some hearings on it. So that's, that's what Tallahassee is all about, folks. It's, um, it's not a real fun place to be. It's a challenging. Uh, but, you know, like uh, the senator and I always said, someone's got to do it, and we're proud to do that. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, and thanks for that update. Um, I, I think that was a great overview, because I'll tell you, um, when you did come in and say it was 60 days of of danger or very dangerous days, I don't disagree with you. And I think I start to wonder why does, why do we, I feel like many people in Tallahassee don't like the rest of the state. These are un, nonpartisan bills. They're not going to just affect the Democrats. They're going to affect the Republicans as well. And when you're taking money away from our school system, and placing it elsewhere, watch what happens. It's not going to be a good effect. And I think that I'm hoping that it shows the signs quicker than later, because once it's seated, it's harder to get it back. And it can be a slow process to 
you know, a bad area, or it could be a fast one, and I'm hoping for the fast because, again, this is, this is our education system for our kids, and I, I don't know what's going to happen. And we already are. I mean, I know that the, the public here feels very strongly that we are putting so much of our taxes to the, um, the school system, many of which don't have children here, and they question it, but it's important, you know, even though um, I don't have children in the public school system right now either. But when you're gutting the system, you have to wonder what we are going to have as a product of that in the next 12 years, and that's fearful. Not to mention half of the other things that you mentioned. I mean, I don't even want to go into it, but that one is so near and dear to my heart because I feel like that can really make a huge difference in, in what Florida becomes. So anyway, I'll, go ahead. Mayor, if I may, uh, and, uh, we, I don't think we alluded to it uh, yet, uh, but there, there was another bill that passed. Uh, uh, first and foremost, they tried to lower the uh, age of uh, gun ownership from 21 down to 18. 18 yep. And this is after they made that promise to the Parkland parents that that would never happen. Uh, fortunately, it never got moving in the Senate, but it did pass the House. The other one that we all should be concerned about out there in public is the concealed carry. Absolutely. No more yeah. permitting needed. If you have a gun, you can put it under your coat, in your pants, under your arm, wherever you want, and carry that gun down Atlantic Ave. Chief, I, I know this, you'd have, this has to be a concern for, for our law enforcement offices. Um, and that passed. And I, uh, folks, and this is, uh, this is a prediction. This is a prediction. Open carry, open carry, where somebody can sling a rifle or put a holster on, carry a gun in the open, that's coming to a session near you. All right, it's coming. Uh, and it's scary as it sounds, but that's what we deal with. That's the mindset of some of the things. And like you said, Mayor, it doesn't just affect Democrats and Republicans, it's statewide. You know, uh, and it's. it's Landlords are not just Democrats, ex Republicans too. And these, these exactly. Bills that are coming through are going to affect. Exactly. Everyone. And we got to stop making this partisan uh, divide. I agree uh, we're, 100%. We're all here to help all Floridians. All Floridians, and, and, and that's what our offices try to do. So thank you. you. I won't take any more time. Job. Thank you so much for fighting for us. Is there anybody else that wants to ask some questions? Yes, sir. <coughs> Deputy Vice Mayor. Well, I just want to thank you guys. Thank you to um, Senator Berman and Representative uh, Casello for being here tonight, uh, giving us the good, the bad, and the ugly. A um, lot of a lot of bad, unfortunately. It sounds like uh, with the tax on our public education, on our home rule, and on our unions, and um, it's, it's it's scary, but. You know, just hearing about it for a few minutes was demoralizing. And you guys do this for 60 days. I don't know how you do it. Um, and you, you, what well, you guys do up there ain't easy. And uh, so I just want to thank you for your hard work up there. It's largely a thankless job, frankly. And so thanks for being here tonight and kind of giving us the, the lowdown. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Frankel. Very nice to see you both. Um, yeah. Thank you for hosting us for Palm Beach County Days. It was always good yeah, to be for that. It yeah. was good. The yeah. question I had was something that's uh, very important here in our city um, about how some members that you serve with tried to restrict uh, our ability to regulate Airbnbs and other vacation rentals. And it's my understanding that isn't going to take effect. It, it fails. So. Thank, thankfully, this year again, every every year pretty much there's a Airbnb bill, um, and once again it failed. So that's the good news. So whatever you are doing now with Airbnbs, you can continue to do in the future. But don't think it won't come back again. It, it is it is a, a a perennial bill that comes, and at some point you're gonna have to you know keep up there and and keep fighting for for yourselves and your city. So okay, Lynn, we got to get to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got a lot of work on that issue. Uh, thank you very much. It's great yeah. to see you both. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. And, thank and you. I did want to talk about the schools real briefly. What he sure. said. Don't forget that that we are now like a, any private school, any person at a private school. So if your child w never went to public school, I mean, you will be able to get a voucher now. And Money that's is going to be good. bled off. Yes, and they did it in Arizona. They did the exact same bill, and the vast and they they underestimated significantly how much it would cost because all the private school parents put in for it, and there's no limit. Like you said, you can be a billionaire, you can be a millionaire, and now you're going to be able to get 
put your child in, you know, get $8,500 from the state, not to mention the homeschool parents, which is, are also going to, for the most part, going to be able to get $8,500 per child. Um, so it's a zero-sum game, unfortunately. If we had unlimited funds, that would be fine, but we don't. And I am very worried about what's going to happen to our public school systems and how they're going to figure it out. There's even something in there that your child can go part-time to a, a, our public schools. So if you want to send your child to high school to take calculus only, they're going to be allowed to do that. And I don't know how this is going to work for our school systems. It's going to be a nightmare. So um, get ready. Yes, <laughs> Buckle up. Yeah, so. Mr. Burns, you. would you like to say anything? Yes, I just want to say uh, to Senator Berman and uh, Representative Costello, thank you so much. And as an educator for the last 32 years, it's very concerning to me um, about this, uh, this, uh, the, but these um, grants that these uh, people will be getting and taking away from education, and also the. Um, the union, yeah, the union um, as a member yeah. of a union, uh, my whole teaching career. Um, so it's very concerning, and thank you for giving us an update. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor? Yeah, I was actually on the phone with Matt uh, Forrest right before oh, this okay. meeting, and we were talking about the good news that we've made it onto the, onto the list, but we've been there before. I do, I do appreciate you uh, mentioning EJS Project, because the city's not the only one that tries to bring funds home. Some of our nonprofits try to as well. Um, so now we just have to hope that we don't, uh, we don't, we're not on the veto list. So if you could just give me the governor's cell phone number. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write that down here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I can get you an assist, one of his assistants, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll You know, I have to tell that. you, um, and that is a big shout out if Matt's listening. He's been a, a great guide, and I, I would be remiss not to mention that we did not have a um, leg I mean a um, lobbyist for the city when I first arrived and uh, one of the uh, earlier on uh, commissioners that I also served with is in the audience uh, Ger Giordana Jarjura who um, w was with me when we were making the decision to bring on a, a, um, a lobbyist and and it has been absolutely one of the best things that we've ever done because of the amount of money that we've received we would have never had coming in had it not been for the great guidance of um, our lobbyist in telling us what you know um, projects are most likely going to be uh, if water was the real topic of that year, we put in water projects. And if it was, uh, you know, environmental, we put in environmental. And that has made all the difference in the world to be able to get some of those dollars that are going up to Tallahassee going elsewhere if you're not asking for them. So you guys have been great in standing up for us, but it's also been great to have a, a wonderful uh, lobbyist absolutely. leading the way. Yeah. And I will uh, preference that, Mayor, is that if you watch Matt work up there oh, I have. at the Capitol, he's like, right, he's like the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> He's amazing. And, and he works for a lot of a few municipalities, and the way he can keep things in their silos absolutely. is absolutely amazing. And it's imperative to have lobbyists, uh, police folks. Don't don't ever you know try to vote that out or anything. That's the only way anything ever gets done in Tallahassee is through the lobbying firms. Uh, that's just the, that's and the I way. I feel like life. we've got one of the best. Uh, you, I mean, we're lucky because we we you share do. him with you up yes, there in Boynton Beach. Yeah. So, you got it. So yeah. it's all good. Thank you, folks. Right. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much for coming Thanks. in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to our next presentation, which is our Delray Beach greenhouse ga gas inventory. Mr. Kent Edwards. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's good to be here, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Deputy Vice Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, Ken Edwards, Sustainability Officer for the City of Delray Beach, and I will be presenting on the Delray Beach Greenhouse Gas Inventory and Emission Reduction Goals. So I'll start off and, and say that climate change is real. Unfortunately, there has been a lot of discussion and confusion um, that is more coming to an end, but I, I think that it's important for people to understand this is a challenge that, uh, that we are facing. Um, there are things that we can do. So the International Panel on Climate Change is a worldwide consortium of, of scientists in many different kinds of, of study areas. They put together 
multiple reports and the latest of those, the sixth, um, has recently been released. This is one of the summary for policymaker slides and it is, it has a lot of information on, on there. Uh, so let me walk through. Um, so at the bottom axis you have years, so 2000 to 2100. On the uh, y-axis you have gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalents. The black line on the left is existing data that, that we know and has been collated. So you see the increase of 20% or so emissions in 2000 to 2018. Beyond that are model lines. So the red line is uh, promises and policies that have been put in place. Uh, emissions would remain fairly stable over the future. And the increase in temperatures that would be associated with that would be uh, above two degrees, uh, three degrees Celsius or, or more. If policies are, are put in place, and if you look at 2030, then about a 50% cut in current uh, emissions uh, um, would be on the limiting of two degrees C or one degree, one and a half degrees C. At 2050, then you'll be close to the net zero line. So this, this lays out for us what we would need to do for carbon uh, dioxide emissions in order to limit um, increase of, of temperatures. So why is increase in temperature important? Actually, I included a, a link to the full uh, report. There's a tremendous amount of data there and the citation that's required in order to use the information. But why is it important? Uh, at one and a half uh, degrees uh, Celsius, with that increase, and some areas have already seen that, uh, talking about worldwide population, 14% uh, would have severe heat waves. With just a two degree Celsius increase, that's a 20 percentage point increase of population worldwide that's going to face heat waves. Millions and millions of people in the second paragraph um, is another example of this. And there, there are many, many studies that have been put together to, to make these, these estimates. So limiting increase to one and a half degrees Celsius um, would uh, reduce uh, people that are frequently at extreme heat waves um, by hundreds of, of millions. If we go up to two degrees Celsius and we're going to have hundreds of millions of more people on a regular basis that are exposed uh, to those heat waves. And heat is something that we all experience here in South Florida, uh, along with the humidity, is something that affects our, our ability to get out. It affects outside workers. Um, on, on, another, um, on another piece of data, uh, 2018 study, 25 years worth of, of data for increase in sea level rise. Um, on that same trajectory of increase, at 2100, we would have 26 inches more sea level rise. Over the last 100 years, we've seen about a foot. So we'd be talking in, in 77 years, we'd see more than two feet. That trajectory is actually changing, and sea level rise is increasing over the recent years. So 26 inches is probably a, a low estimate. That, that's why limiting to one and a half degrees and certainly more than two uh, degrees Celsius is so important. And there is a link to the NASA study where these and, and other uh, impacts are, are done. So. This is why the city of Delray Beach joined a cohort uh, that was organized by the Florida League of Cities and led by ICLEI. Uh, we did a greenhouse gas inventory and that inventory allows us to see where we are right now. What are the sources of greenhouse gases? What is the level of greenhouse gases? Because going forward, if we put policies, procedures, outreach in place to reduce emissions, we have to know how we're doing. We need to, to know in, in the beginning, where do we put our, our efforts? And then as we go along, we get to measure how well we're doing. This is one of the graphs uh, from the study, and I, I don't expect you to look at, at all of the numbers, but I, I wanted to impress there was a significant amount of data that we gathered from different sources. We got FPL uh, to give us information on residential and commercial and industrial sources of electricity. We had a transportation model that was free that was done by Google to estimate the amount of emissions from transportation. We got information from Solid Waste Authority, our own city utility, 
uh, the regional wastewater and, and other places to put together this very large amount of data to give us an estimate of our greenhouse gas emissions citywide. And, you, and we come up with a 550,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. This slide uh, also from the report gives uh, where, what are the sectors that that carbon dioxide is coming from. It's very informative in that 52% comes from transportation and then uh, more than 40% comes from residential and uh, commercial energy use. So overall, about 96% of our carbon emissions come from residential commercial energy use and transportation. So that points us in a direction of we need to address those kinds of sources with policies and, and outreach if we're going to make progress towards a, a reduction in, in carbon emissions. So that, that can be an overwhelming uh, amount of, of data and I, I just wanted to take a minute and emphasize again why are we talking about climate change and why is it important for us to reduce our carbon emissions and limit the increase of, of temperature. So what we are seeing is that uh, though there is not an increase in the number, the average number of hurricanes that we see every year, we are seeing an increase in the category of those hurricanes. So we're seeing more category three, four, and five, and those are the most devastating kinds of, of hurricanes. They're the most powerful, most damaging. Also, just a few weeks ago in Broward County, saw rainfall like has never been seen before. There was flooding at the airport and the port that shut down operations. That's just a little bit south of us. And as the atmosphere warms, it holds more water. So we're going to see more of these heavy rainfall events because there's more moisture in, in the atmosphere to fall. We're also seeing more days of, of extreme heat. Uh, last year, in some parts of the state of Florida, 90 days um, in a row over 90 degrees. That is extreme heat kind of weather. Um, and especially for people that are working outdoors, that has a, a tremendous effect on, on workers and, and safety and, and health. Those are the direct kinds of effects. The indirect kinds of, of effects, economic impacts. So when the port was flooded and gasoline couldn't get out, then that's when everyone had to line up at the, at the gas station because there was a shortage of gasoline. People could not have their, their normal commerce and there's a, an effect on, on, on the economy. Um, when a hurricane comes through, the economy of an area is affected. It takes time to, to rebuild. There's not the productivity that, that's there. So uh, again, economic impacts are going to be an indirect uh, effect as we're facing climate change. Um, another indirect effect is with immigration. Um, those areas, and there are some Pacific Island countries that are looking at not having any emergent land. There are plenty of coastal areas in Asia, India is one example where there already are seeing mass populations that need to relocate. There's droughts, there's famine. There's going to be more of that happening, and, and I'm not here to say, oh, the, the sky is falling, but these are things that need to be planned for, and we in a leadership role can reduce our carbon emissions and keep our temperature rise down and get other people on board with us. It is in our own best interest to, to do those things. So uh, the suggested goal, and this comes out of the uh, United Nations Race to Zero and what was organized by ICLEI and Florida League of Cities, is to reduce our carbon emissions by 50% by the year 2030. That is just seven years away. So that is a major undertaking. I, I realize that. But that is what we need to, to do to be on the right trajectory to keep temperature increase down to one and a half degrees, and then net zero by, by 2050. So for your consideration, those goals. Wow, that's perfect. <laughs> Can't even believe it. You win the prize. Um, I, I, you know, I have to tell you, I, in, your, in that chart that you put up, it, the heaviest, uh, I think, greenhouse gas uh, inventory that was recorded, wasn't that in automobiles? I, I was looking well, down just Percentage-wise, transportation was 52%. Right. Yeah, that's what I kind of thought I saw it. I just wasn't sure if I was seeing it. So obviously we're heading in the right direction to um, work on something that we are trying to take that down as 
<laughs> quickly as we can, that's an area that we could actually do that. So what are our what are we going to do to do this? How are we going to meet that goal? Well, in, in transportation, we would need to look at, at more mass transit, fewer cars uh, being used, more opportunities for people to get in to the area uh, without having to drive an individual vehicle. The use of electric vehicles would be a, a part of that. So within the city, certainly using those, um, allowing people uh, that have electric vehicles to have places where, where they charge. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that that whole range of purchasing and policies and, and regulatory is what we would have have to do in, in order to to make a difference well if we don't do it i don't know who is so i think that we are it and i think that we need to be moving forward exactly in these um with policies like this i really do because otherwise um well listen i think it may be anyway but you know it depends on how our neighbors all feel about this and the world feels about this and how they respond to it as well because we're all in it together it's a nonpartisan issue again we're all it in is. this together and if we don't start recognizing it it's it's uh it's going to be very concerning we aren't on a mountain anywhere we're at sea level very close to sea level one other question that i have because i've done a little bit of exploration of this you know as as the temperatures rise and it's important to understand it melts our ice caps which adds to the water which basically desalinates slows down our you know our our uh, our wonderful almost like a wall of water out there called the um gulf stream and the gulf stream is higher on one side than it is on our side so you start to wonder if that slows down enough we're going to be impacted with even more water than what this, these, these uh, are they, have they taken that into consideration? There are some models, and, and they are circulation models, so it, it is somewhat difficult, and you're talking about changes in the density of seawater because of uh, runoff from, from melt, but there certainly are studies that, that say that that conveyor that runs from uh, the Gulf of Mexico oh, yeah. up to uh, Greenland and in the uh, North Atlantic Arch could salt. Uh, reduce um, the the rate because once that water gets to the north, it actually sinks. Yeah. So that that's where it goes. It goes into the deeps. If that slows down, then it's going to pile up even more. Mm -hmm. um, it would be more in the northeast United States, according to the models and research that I have seen. Yeah. But yes, it would impact the, the United States and coastal areas. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Yeah, I'll just. Uh, well, Ken, I got a little bit of a preview uh, of this because we were in a, in a group on, uh, on Friday talking about it at goal setting. Um, you know, everybody does need to do their part, right? And as our city, we need to, and hope, like the mayor said, hope the rest of the world does our part, does their part. Um, but as a coastal city, we really have to be a leader. We are going to be impacted the most. And as a coastal city, we're in, we're in demand. People want to be here. We are able to put additional restrictions on building. We are able to require more charging stations. Unlike maybe some cities in inland Florida or in the middle of our country that just can't do that. They're hoping anyone builds anything, right? Um, but here, we can do that. Um, so I am open to any and every recommendation that you have. I look forward to in two years when we take a, another look at our green building ordinance and hopefully we get a lot stricter on that and lead our state in that conversation. Um, but especially in regards to the, in regards to the charging sh stations and anything that we can do. We're, we're lucky that we do have um, the auto industry here. We're selling more and more electric cars every day um, right in our own backyard. Uh, but anything that we can do to, to help, I'm, I'm open. And, and I'll just mention on the electric vehicles, one of the bills that, that passed was, uh, that was sponsored by Representative Caruso, was now an evaluation of a purchase of a vehicle has to address maintenance and fuel costs. Both of those are less for EVs. Mm -hmm. So the, the government is recognizing in its policies that like, like that, that will encourage government and, and private sector to go that way. So if you bring up any suggestions or you think things that we could do in order to be able to push this even further, let us know because sim simple things can make a, a world difference over the long term. So we will work on it. All right. Sounds good. Anything else from anyone? Seeing none. Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Edwards, for this great uh, presentation. We so appreciate it. All right. Moving on to the mid-year financial review. Mr. Hugh Dunkley. <coughs>
Yes, uh, good evening, Mayor Petrolia, Vice Mayor Boylston, members of the City Commission. Uh, this evening, it is my aim, uh, so to speak, to give you an overview of the city's uh, budgetary performance and, of course, the relative financial position as of March 31st, 2023, the midpoint of our fiscal year. The chart is a little bit, hopefully it's visible enough to both you and the audience. The total city budget for the year is allocated amongst various types of funds, the largest of which is the general fund. The general fund uh, houses most of the city's core services, police protection, fire protection, parks and recreation, public works, etc. For this reason, we'll place a greater emphasis on the budgetary performance of this fund and its component departments. The general fund with a budget of $168 million makes up almost half of the total city budget. As is usually the case with most municipalities, the lion's share of the revenues for the general fund is from tax receipts. When I say tax receipts, I primarily mean uh, property taxes, utility service taxes on gas and electricity, business tax receipts, and uh, taxes of that nature. The total budgeted receipts from taxes approximate $103 million as the graph uh, depicts, or 61% of the general fund budget. The city also assesses user fees and charges for services that are provided to the general public. We also receive funds from units of other local governments in the form of grants and state shared revenue. The miscellaneous category, revenue category, uh, comprises of investment income as well as received some rents and royalties contributions from the CRA for specified projects and administrative fees that are charged to other user departments. So the general fund expenditures, as to be expected, the lion's share of this is in the form of personnel services, and that's about 60% of the uh, total expenditures there with the breakdown. Grants and aid, there is uh, that's reflective of $18.6 million that's already paid to the CRA for tax incremental revenues. So we collect the taxes and then distribute the CRA's portion uh, for the tax incremental revenue for the um, CRA. So this category also reflects the grants and aid category, grants to nonprofit institutions that provide services to the city's residents. Hopefully the number is, is uh, my aim also, in addition to giving broad brushstrokes, is hopefully not to belabor you with too many numbers. So this I won't particularly uh, discuss each line items, but I just wanna just indicate that the total general fund, uh, the total expenditures, revenues rather, are collected year to date represents 72% of the general fund budget. And this is the case because we collect most of our property taxes up, up uh, in the first uh, three months of the fiscal year. So there the total collections are skewed. Uh, but year to date, we have collected 72% of the total projected revenues. For expenditures, the city, we have expended 53% of the budget. Um, and the 53% is, is broken out. Some are significantly in excess of the 50% mark, one of which is the grant and aid, grants and aids uh, row there, which I referenced earlier. The other is, is with the debt service, which our debt service is due 
well before the end of the quarter that ended March 31st. Personnel services are our biggest expenditure category is right at, it's rather, it's a little bit below the 50 cent, 50% 50 mark, which is encouraging. So for the city's departments, individual departments within the general fund, most of the departments remain at or near the 50% uh, mark. Those departments that were well below the 50% mark had vacancies or there were either episodic projects that uh, the expenses, expenses which have not been incurred uh, as of the end of the quarter. This graph here represents segmented information of the, the city's enterprise and special revenue. We have one major special revenue fund, which is the building fund. That's of major import to us because that generates a, a significant amount of revenues in the form of permit fees. The water and sewer revenue, sanitation and stormwater, those individual funds are holding their own. One thing that's missing from here is what we typically re refer to as accrual basis expenditures, such as depreciation, accrued interest, and so forth. So if we take the water and sewer fund, for instance, even though at first blush, it appears that the revenues are outpacing the expenditures, uh, at the end of the day, we have depreciation expense uh, in the amount of $4.4 .4 million. So you could readily see where the expenses will uh, catch up with, with the revenues. In terms of the city's cash and investment position, the total cash and investments at the end of the quarter uh, amounted to $195.4 million. And so what I've done here is, is pretty much just put in buckets, the three main buckets where we hold all of our investable uh, resources, uh, either in bank deposits, we have a liquidity portfolio and, as well as a core portfolio. The liquidity portfolio is managed in-house and the court, core portfolio is managed by a professional money manager. And the major distinction between the two is that the core portfolio tends to have maturities of a uh, little bit, perhaps two years or greater, whereas our liquidity portfolio, we try and stay um, perhaps no longer than a year or so, a little bit over a year. But we're looking at $195.4 million in total investments. And so. Uh, in terms of our investment um, policy, so the investment policy sets certain per parameters, the first of which is what I uh, refer to as sector allocation, which speaks to the type of investment, in, in example, whether it, it's treasury securities, agencies, corporates, um, asset-backed securities, what type of investment can we invest in? There is a limit and the white portion of the graph that extends to the far right indicates the, the amount or the percentage uh, tolerance to which we can invest in each particular sector. Uh, as of the end of the fiscal quarter, we were well within each permissible range. Then there is another uh, limitation, it's called maturity, maximum maturity parameters. And so what that is, is how long can we, uh, what is it, the duration or the maturity of the investment instrument? If we're investing in uh, two-year treasury notes or uh, a, a 10-year bond, which typically we, most of our investments are, are well within maturity limits. And for the most part, we try to stay within a five-year. We don't go beyond the five-year maturity uh, duration. And the last uh, is issuer diversification. And if, if any of you perhaps have 
been listening to the news, you've heard about um, Silicon Valley Bank and um, Credit Suisse and those entities which have caught to some degree some uh, financial trouble. But what our investment policy does, it says we're not allowed to invest depending on the type or the sector, U.S. treasuries or what have you, we can only invest up to a specified percentage uh, of our investments in that particular vehicle. U.S. Treasury securities, excuse me, the issuer diversification is pretty much close to 100%. But for other more volatile or more uh, risky investments, the, the, the limit is significantly lower, in some cases 5%. <coughs> During the quarter, we had a net inflows of approximately $579,000 um, uh, to our core portfolio. And the, the major takeaway from this graph in particular is, is the fact that we, we, there was kind of a movement towards the corporates and the asset-backed securities. And there, uh, what we noticed was that the spreads in, in those particular investment types were a little bit uh, greater. They widened, so the, there was more of an appetite to pick up more of those um, investments. We, we did pick up some treasuries, but we, we sold a little bit more of what, than what we picked up. All in all, uh, the total uh, quarterly performance for the portfolio, there was a 1.51% total on a total return basis. And the total return, on a total re return basis, what that means is I'm not only looking at the, the net inflows in terms of interest and um, investment income, what I'm looking at also is what they call unrealized gain or loss. So in, in terms of if we're holding a particular fixed income security and the interest rates are rising, there is a great likelihood, as is occurred last quarter, that we're going to have a significant unrealized loss. In this case, for this quarter, uh, we had a total return of 1.51% versus the benchmark, which, is, which earned 1.55%. In dollar terms, we had a change in market value of our investments of $1.1 million and $630,000 in interest earned. And with that said, I'm available for any questions that you might have. Okay. Thank you. To the commission. Anyone? Um, just a couple of questions. You, uh, on the earlier uh, uh, slides, there was a, um, other sources, 27%. I just was curious to go back, all the way back to the beginning real quick. I should I put down the number? Hey, wait a second. Uh, oh, I think I know where you're speaking you of. Just pat, yeah. pat. This one here. No, there was one where you had a percentage. I just was curious as to why it was only 27% when everything else was um, that, at that 50% level. There was like a, 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 a grid, grid or a graph. There it goes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, definitely. Why, why, why are we at 27% there? And I mean, I understand the fines and for Well, I was going to ask about the fines and for forfeitures too. It would appear to me that we were low on estimating our fines and for forfeitures because if we're already at 97% of what we expected to come in, I would think that that is probably half of what we should have predicted. Yes? Correct. Okay. And then why are we so far behind in the other sources? Just curious if we're yeah, halfway through the year. Good point. So the other sources, those represent budgetary um, carryover. Okay. Uh, one, which is $2.5 million in usage of previous year's uh, fund balance, okay. which, which is not necessarily as you I know. I gotcha. Exactly. And then the other is a carryover of um, uh, prior so That's It's not indicative of where we are in, this, in, the, in the current year as much as it is just what, where we are in that particular. I got it. Exactly. Okay, so future, keep going forward. There's one where it's a communications is zero. 
Uh, yes, we did a reorganization. What we'll be doing is it an adjustment. It was a $500,000 line item there that is like looking like we're not even going to spend it, or is that going to be moving over to our communications department so that they can use that for where we move those? Correct. We'll be doing an adjusting journal entry to Got move it. the actual expenses from the city manager's department to okay. its rightful. And then I was just going to make a comment to my colleagues. Um, we had a request from our building department. We have people that are housed in the in the hallways for their offices. It looks like our building department is fine to be able to handle a renovation in order to be able to restructure or, or add on or do what um, our, our building um, uh, director, building department director felt was important. And I think that we should consider that and, and, and ask Mr. Moore to follow through with it. I took that as um, plausible direction during a goal setting strategy, so uh, we are working collaboratively to offer some definitive recommendations. And much of this is, in fact, as you stated, Mayor, a function of the health of the building fund outcome. So yep. duly noted, and it has been noted, and we look forward to working with all involved. Very good. Thank you so much, Hugh. Um, it was very interesting. Is there, there's no other questions? appreciate the presentation and the um, mid-year budget uh, review. All right, moving on to uh, comments and inquiries on agenda and non-agenda item. Mr. Moore, you have uh, something about our seaweed situation. Yes, ma'am. And ladies and gentlemen, we have several presentations this evening. Please be mindful that I am supportive of the direction recently offered relative to being tight with respect to presentations. However, with the state representatives and the commitment offered previously for a May 16th presentation to this effect, not to mention the update relative to financial conditions of the city are very important. Nevertheless, we'll be mindful of the direction offered in terms of expectations regarding the management of presentations. And I offer that because this is the last presentation of this evening formally, and this will be quite brief. And this is in response to the sargasm issue, i.e. seaweed proliferation that is to be experienced on Delray Beach's coast, beginning in the coming months, actually taking shape at this particular point in time. So myself, working collaboratively with leadership of the Department of Parks and Recreation and the Department of Public Works, were able to, A, benchmark with other municipalities, other coastal municipalities along southeast Florida to ascertain what issues and concerns might be evident and thus what practices are being executed as well as to offer a brief update relative to the environmental conditions associated with this particular phenomenon and therefore Mr. Mitat and Ms. Barletto briefly if you can enlighten the city commission to this effect I think clarity will be achieved. Gentlemen, ladies. Good afternoon, uh, Sam Mitat, Director of Parks and Recreation, joined with Missy Barletto. <laughs> Director of Public Works. Can we get the presentation up, please? Yeah. And it is short. We'll be brief. We'll summarize. Oh, it. that's the wrong presentation. <laughs> um, we just wanted to take a moment and just touch base with the commission on um, the sargasm, what a lot of people refer to as the seaweed. Um, I don't see the presentation on the list, Darcy. Hmm. Uh, it, it's okay. I think I think I can summarize it well uh, for the commission. Um, as many of you know, um, recent technological advances have increased uh, in an overall awareness of what sargasm is and what it's about. Um, it's much more popular, and um, this is really a discussion because m recent media reports have indicated that we're looking at a very large um, bloom of sargasm this summer, and different entities have different suggestions on how to kind of take care of or manage their beach, and um, control some of that sargasm that's on the beach uh, accumulating it throughout the summer. What is sargasm? It's essentially seaweed uh, and it has mixed mixtures of natural orga organisms um, within that seaweed. It washes up all day long during the busy the busiest times of the summer. Um, it has tiny sea creatures in it that can irritate the skin if, if, if they get on it. Uh, decomposing sargasm causes an unpleasant smell. It's one of the complaints that you hear most about it. However, sargasm itself does not sting or cause rashes, but some of those organisms may, that are in it may irritate the skin. Um, there is a hydrogen sulfide level in, uh, in areas like the beach where large amounts of the airflow can dilute the levels. It's not expected to harm, um, be harmful to your health. Uh, Palm Beach County 
issued what is a, like a white paper or their report on how they would like to manage it from both their environmental resources management team as well as their parks and recreation department back on March 14th. And they essentially recommend a hands-off approach. So they, their plan to manage the Palm Beach County beaches is to not touch the sargasm at all. Let it decompose naturally, let it wash in and out with the change in the uh, current. Um, they look at it as a naturally occurring. It helps capture the, any wind-blown sand and keep it on your beach. Um, active management could affect the turtles during peak nesting season. And, and of course, removal can be costly and it's a continuous thing. Like you, rem you miss one day and you wouldn't think it never happened again. Um, many of you are aware we're, we have a special week here with the Blue Flag Beach coming up. Um, and I think it's an important note that Criteria number 16 of the 33 requirements that we had to meet for the blue flag designation um, addresses some of this. And, and it talks about that it, the sarcasm is a natural debris that must be left on the beach. Uh, the entire beach is an ecosystem and it must be considered a living and natural environment and not only as a recreational asset to be neat and tidy at all times. Um, vegetation should not be allowed to accumulate to the point where it becomes a hazard. However, only if it's absolutely necessary should vegetation be removed. Um, wherever possible, environmental specialists should be consulted regarding the management of the vegetation on the beach. And there is a provision in the county um, uh, ordinance or uh, direction as well that does allow, if it does become an obstacle, that you know you can make pathways in it, you can remove it if necessary, and they would address that on a need, you know, case by case basis if that becomes an issue. But again, their recommendation, much like the blue flag recommendation, is to um, not touch it as much as possible. So what do we do? Um, we try to leave the sargasm in place. Um, however, uh, when deposits are significant, each morning, um, we have a beach raker company that tills it and rakes it into the sand. So we don't remove it, but it does, you know, for the visitor to the beach, it kind of disappears a little bit. You see it looks like a darker, shadier portion of the sand. Um, this complies with the Palm Beach County recommendations and still complies with the blue flag recommendations um, and is considered a scientific best practice. Uh, city staff ensures that the coastal management practices represent a balance of safe recreational use, coastal resiliency, and a protection of our natural resource. Uh, in summary, the season, seasonal and annual sargasm is a cyclical component of the local ecosystem. Delray's proximity to the Gulf Stream and the seasonal onshore summer winds means sargasm, it will have an impact we've seen over the recent years um, and that staff regularly monitors sargasm deposits and makes decisions based on that um, and we will try to continue to do so moving forward um, and we're here to answer any questions you may have if, if you have any any questions yes. yeah. go right ahead um, thank you for the presentation um, at the tourist development council meeting last week basically the environmental folks said the same thing and I'm just glad that you have reached out and spoken to them um, they're on it they're you know researching it and they've you know whatever plan they have they're certainly sharing it with the cities so I'm glad you're in contact with them because I think it's a good resource so far the beach was looked okay uh, over the weekend mm -hmm. and uh, I did see the big rake doing exactly what you said and you know so far so good but hopefully it doesn't get too bad over the summer because I think that's when it's going to impact us the most thank you let's get Vice the word out yeah, I, that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, what is going to happen here is we're probably going to get a larger buildup than normal. And um, you know that when the uh, condos that are along the ocean who think that the city takes care of their beach area too, it just starts to build up and it becomes just almost impos impassable. We get the calls, why aren't we cleaning the beaches? Well, they're not ours. But I'm afraid that we're going to probably get a little bit more of that if it is as big of a pile that's supposedly coming in. We may miss it all, I don't know, but if it does come in, so I think the best way to deal with this so that we're not getting inundated is to have a send out messaging to let everybody know we know what to expect and you should know what to expect and this is natural and we're going along with the best practices and that way people will be more understanding on the front end than us having to put out fires on the backside. That would be my recommendation. Yes, sir. So I'm, I'm always obviously always in favor of doing what the environmental best practices are. Um, but, you know, we've all done research on this, and 
it seems like this is something that is getting worse every year. A lot of it's due to climate change. Um, you think long term, we may have to take a less passive approach to dealing with this, that this seems like to be an emerging issue. I mean, we've always had it, but it seems to be getting worse and worse. Um, and it does, it is, it could cause some serious economic issues to our city as well as maybe health issues down the road. I don't know. But um, do you see down the road us having to maybe take more precautions or take some steps to limit how much of this gets onto the beach or find a way to harvest it or, or do something? Did any of that sort of come up in the research and discussions you guys were having? Um, I can can share with you that the American Shore and Beach Preservation Association is routinely looking at this all across the country, not just on the East Coast or just in Florida. Um, some of the problems with alternate methods of dealing with the, the sargassum are, the, are that some communities have tried to rake it up as it comes in and create compost piles out of it. Um, as you know, if you've been to the beach when there's been a heavy deposit, it does not smell good. Mm -hmm. And it creates bigger problems for the community at large once you try to remove it from the beach and do something like that with it. So, and that is why the, all of the environmentalists have looked at doing the gentle raking into the sand to make it more pleasant to walk out to the water that preserves the, the life that's inside of it as well as, as making it um, more tolerable for beachgoers. The, so much of whether it's a problem on the beach or not is dependent on wind direction and wave action that is very difficult to predict in advance whether even though there's a big, um, I think the, the media calls it blob of it out there in the ocean, whether it's actually going to make it onto shore or not make it onto shore. So it's, it's, uh, it's not one of those things I think that you can have significant plans for in advance. You kind of have to deal with it as it happens. Thank you. All right. Very good. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate Thank the uh, the presentation. All right. Moving on. Mr. Moore, do you have anything else as far as? I yield at this time. Thank you. Okay. Very good. So we're <coughs> going to move to the public comment section. If there's anybody in the audience that would like to speak to any item that is not a quasi-judicial or public hearing item, now would be your opportunity. Step forward. State your name and address. Make sure you sign in, too. And then you'll have three minutes. Michael Wendell Ray Beach. Hmm? Hello, everybody. Hello. I like when Shelly Petrolia calls me Mr. Wind. I think I'm still 50, <laughs> but I'm 75, 76. I love Delray Beach. I'm going to stay here until I die. I already signed papers. Do not resuscitate me. So I want to die here. This is my final stop. I've been all over the world, 30 countries in the world. I worked international business. I did everything in my life. I hired the first black woman to sell Cadillacs. She came to for work wearing African clothes. Nobody would ever hire her sell Cadillacs in America, ever. I hired her. I'm a leader all my life. I run car dealerships. I had one car deal one time. Sometimes you get a good assignment and sometimes you get a lousy assignment. I had one assignment, Rockwell Center, Cooper Pontiac BMW. I came in, then every single person quit. I was there by myself with one man, maintenance man. He looked like that man. He had that employee of the year award. He looked just like that man. I'm not mechanical at all. All my life I spent in the office. He looked just like that man, with the shirt sticking out, everything. The first thing I did, I bought him a uniform. I told him, deliver it in the morning, $40 out of my pocket, not corporation. I gave him a raise on the end of the month. Here we have a month, a, a person, same person, that work here, employee of the year, got a big plaque like this, and a small plaque. This big plaque don't fit his house. He don't live in this type of house. And $200 cash. 
Why don't we just give him $500 cash? He don't need these plaques. Nobody, working people don't need plaques. They need money. This is hypocrisy. This is hypocrisy. This is all not true. You're not fair to the people. Not fair. Evil. Teachers got plaques. They don't need plaques. They need money. The leaders, what leaders? <coughs> you leader if you do something. You're not a leader. It's not like you're going through drive through you pay $37 and you get a leader certificate. You gotta do something. We have people that can do something. He's a computer guy, he's a computer guy. Thank do your job. Have a nice day. Thank you so much, Mr. Wind. Okay? okay. And we're not political here. We're only about the city. It's not Democrats or Republicans. I was never a member of any party. Thank you. You all have a great day. You too. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> tough one to follow. Mm -hmm. uh, Price Patton, 1020 Tamarind uh, Road. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm here on behalf of the Delray Beach uh, Preservation Trust. We, we approved an ordinance concerning the uh, golf course, and uh, we, our board approved it uh, unanimously uh, last last month we i read the ordinance into the record of the hbb the hbb unanimously supported sorry <laughs> unanimously supported the resolution i would like to read it please into the record a uh, resolution of the delray beach preservation trust urging the historic designation preservation and restoration of the delray beach golf course whereas donald ross was one of the world's one of the nation's finest golf course designers whereas donald ross society has stated his works are an art that merits close, close care and attention. Whereas Donald Ross designed 18 holes for the city, nine of which are now considered the back nine. Whereas Dick Wilson, one of the preeminent golf uh, designers of his generation, designed what is now considered the front nine. Whereas famous golfers, including Gene Saros and Tony Pina, ladies professional golf hall of famer, uh, Beth Daniel, she won like 33 LPGA tournaments. Um, and Betty Jamison, who's one of the founding members of the LPGA, um, they, uh, they graced the course and the, and the grounds for many, many, many years. Whereas the city's comprehensive plan states precious open spaces should be protected. Whereas the comprehensive plan for the first time included an historic protection element to further protect and preserve our historic landmarks. Whereas the Ross 9 was built in 1925, the Wilson 9 built in the 50s, making them both eligible for historic designation. Whereas through lack of oversight and proper funding, the course is in deplorable condition. Whereas the course is nearing its centennial year of operation. Resolved by the Delray Beach Preservation Trust, one, insists that the city commission direct staff to take immediate steps to add the golf course to the local register of historic places urge the city to pursue alternative forms of funding for needed repairs rather than selling any land, urge the city to take advantage of the opportunity to restore both nines to their original condition, and urge the city to reach out to the Donald Ross Society when it concerns uh, the restoration of the back nine. And uh, the trust is here to, to help the city in any way we can, and we'd love to see you uh, direct staff to put this put the this historic uh, property on the on the local register thank you thank you yes sir hi my name is Ron Platt I live at 5120 Pine View Circle in Delray I'm here to speak one more time about my candidacy for that at-large board position on the DDA. I can see, uh, I can hope you can see that I'm passionate about this. This is the second time I've spoken to the commission and probably my last time. I know you're not meeting again on this particular issue till uh, June. Mm -hmm. It's a very important position and as a result, a very important decision for you to make on this position. The DDA is one of the most important boards in the city. It is charged with so many responsibilities, such as promoting the business of all retail professional restaurants and generally speaking, all merchants within its district. It plans concerts, parades, arts and crafts and other fairs and festivals, educational activities, social events, and much, much more. The DDA and many boards and authorities within the city work tirelessly to make Delray what it is and why it has been named an All-America City three times. 
And like all other boards, it does its best to not only consider those folks that are coming into the city uh, to eat, uh, to see activities, and to shop. It's there for the concern of the downtown residents as well. Uh, yes, uh, there are, are other qualified candidates for this position, but this should not be a popularity contest, and this hopefully should not be politically motivated, this decision. Most importantly, this new DDA board member should not be chosen because they may be a dear friend of someone, or they previously may have worked with someone on a committee or business, or because they may agree with one or more of two wish of issues that come before the commission that they feel st strongly about. Many different issues come before the DDA and the city commission over the course of the years, and I would trust you would look at the big picture when voting on an applicant and not just necessarily one or two recent issues or events that has come up. When making your decision, your most important consideration should be who would best serve the city and nothing else. That's all you should think about on this. You should look at every candidate's qualifications and make your own decision on who that one person should be. My self-promotion again is that a, a lawyer, a businessman, a property owner, and doing business in Delray Beach for over 20 years, a former restaurant owner, previous board experience, and the fact that I really care about what is, you know, what is best for this city, uh, and I feel like I am the best person for this position. I truly would be proud and extremely excited to serve on the board of the DDA and serve this city well. And thanks again for hearing me out a second time. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Mr. Platt. Thank you. Appreciate you coming in. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. He is very passionate. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioner, City Manager, City Attorney, and our community. I am Mavis Benson, a resident, business owner, and DDA chair. Vibrant and vibrancy were words that I heard a number of times at your goal setting workshop. They are words that may be interpreted in many ways, so I looked it up. Vibrancy is the state of being full of energy and life, the quality of being energetic, exciting, and full of enthusiasm. Using it in a sentence, no one can fail to be struck by the vibrancy of New York. I could cross out New York and say, no one could fail to be struck by the vibrancy of Delray. Mm -hmm. It's a word that's always a focus and attention, and after hearing your conversation, it will definitely be a top priority in the conversation in our goal setting this year. Many people feel that vibrancy is specific to nighttime. It is not. Thanks to a very simple event, our streets were very vibrant last Thursday, Friday, and Saturday in particular. This was the 15th year of our Mother's Day orchid giveaway. Over the three days, we gave away 350 orchids, which means $70,000 in sales for our merchants. It was wonderful to see mothers, daughters, husbands, and fathers shopping with a purpose to accumulate their $200 in receipts for a beautiful orchid to give in their Mother's Day giving. As a merchant, I'm thrilled for the business that it brings to my gallery, and as a DDA board member, I'm always impressed with the execution and results. It's a simple promotion that is relatively inexpensive, but accomplishes our goal to promote our merchants and bring business throughout our entire downtown. From early morning with shopping at the Green Market, to midday lunch and shopping, an afternoon maybe attending the Cornell Museum or perhaps just playing or relaxing on the old school, ground, school square grounds. Then going into nighttime with dining and entertainment, our downtown is always full of excitement, energy, and enthusiasm. Our vision for a vibrant downtown is almost 24-7. Unlike New York, we do give our downtown a little time to sleep. Thanks to you, our commissioners, our city partners, the CRA, and the Chamber of Commerce, as always, by working together, we continue to produce vibrant and thriving downtown, a vibrant and thriving downtown that benefits everyone in our community. But our biggest thanks go to our residents, our community, 
by shopping in our many businesses and services, dining in our restaurants, and participating in our events, you play a crucial role in creating vibrancy throughout our downtown. For that, we are most grateful. If I could take one second and just share with you, if you haven't seen it, we are having a down, uh, town hall tomorrow evening, and we invite everyone to attend. It's at the um, Vintage Gym at Old School Square. It begins at 5.30, and um, Bob Gibbs will be returning after five years uh, now of being in the um, shopability report, and we're anxious to see what he has to say. So I hope everyone out there can attend. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Anyone else? Seeing no one, public comment is now closed. I'm going to go to consent agenda. I wanted to make one quick um, just adjustment. We had um, the uh, 7D that needed to be moved up. We are an hour and a half into the meeting. I'm wondering if we could just make sure that it's seven, now charges seven AAA so we can move on it first. Sure. Okay. So um, entertain a motion as uh, amended. So moved. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Burns? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Okay, so we're going to move to 7 AAA, which it was 7D Resolution 92 23. Mm -hmm. I hope you can figure out what, how we're going to get to the other items. We're so all, all I have them. Okay. I got them. Um, and I'm. Um, Good evening, Anthea Genotis, Development Services Director. This is typically not an item that would have appeared on the regular agenda, and so maybe I might be able to save all of this time. Yep. Um, Make it quick. The reason mm -hmm. that it is on the regular agenda is, and it's being approved via resolution, is that there is an existing building that is sitting crossing property lines, so there's something of a chicken and an egg situation. So we can't approve the plat until the building is removed, but if they're not going to be able to subdivide it into three parcels, why would they take down the building? And so that is why it's a resolution before you today. And Mr. Carney's here. I don't know if you need a full Motion to approve. Second. <laughs> any, any comments? Anything going on? No? Okay, call the roll, please. I had five pictures. Did you want to? No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> I know you have a pre-, pre I do, I do. Okay, My brother's ahead. birthday, so we're all. Okay, so call the roll, please. Yes. Ms. I'm sorry. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Mr. Boston? Yes. Go enjoy the celebration. Thank you. You're very Thank welcome. You. All right. We're Tom, it was your best presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're going um, to go to uh, 7AA, which was removed from the consent agenda 6G by Mr. Moore. This is a, a sub, subordin subordination of a second mortgage for 1017 Southwest 8th Street. The reason it was removed, there's a slight adjustment to the particular recommendation of which Mr. Walter, our Director of Neighborhood and Community Services, will offer a very brief presentation to clarify accordingly. Very good. Well, before we do that, should we move to approve the consent agenda first? We did. I thought we did. I think they did. They did? Yeah. They did. Okay. As amended. Your two oh, okay. They did. Yeah. I thought it was just to move the other item. Understood. Nope, they no. did it. Did you need something for that other item to be moved? It wasn't moved. It was already moved. I just made just sure that it was a triple, no, 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 triple A instead of I just of want a... the record to be clear that the consent agenda was approved. Okay. Very good. Yes, sir. You can, you've got the floor. Good afternoon or good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the Commission, Sam Walthour, Neighborhood and Community Services. Um, the adjustment to this item, to the subordination, this was a uh, household that got a purchase assistance. There was a uh, better interest rate that was achieved, and we updated it uh, for the uh, total savings went from 32000 over the life of the loan to $37,000. So that's what you see on the marked up copy of the memo that was just passed out to you. So, so what was the change that we, we needed to have this on the uh, regular agenda rather than in the um, consent? because we were talking to the bank as of late today okay. and we just wanted to make sure that we explained what the change was. Got it. Thank you. All right. All right very Backup good. has to be reflected for public domain and therefore that so It'll be a motion to approve as amended? Correct. Yes. So moved. Second. Call the roll, please. Thank you. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Mr. Boylston? 
Yes. Ms. Burns. Yes. Okay, there's just one more change um, that we moved, um, which I did. Um, this was uh, originally 6M moved to 7BB. This is the approval of a First Amendment to the exclusive franchise agreement between the City of Delray Beach and Waste Management. Um, I wanted to ask the question, I'm glad you're up here, Sammy. Um, there was a discrepancy of a $100 fee or fine if uh, garbage pails are 10 inches open with trash. So I just want to make sure everybody understands. Fill those garbage cans up and you're open by 10 inches, you're going to get a $100 fine, but it's not $100, it's actually $200, $200. That's pretty stiff. Is that Okay. If, if, if that's, that's, if that's what it currently is. If I could, it curr okay. it's currently at that, and that's for commercial accounts. That's only the commercial program. Okay. Yes. Not residential. Not only. residential. Okay. Because it didn't. I was. It said the wall of the the receptacle, and I'm yeah. kind of going. That's <laughs> so extreme for the. Okay. Just Absolutely. wanted to make sure. So. Just right. commercial accounts. So then the commercial accounts yes, need to understand if you're ten inches up above where you are, you're getting a two hundred dollar fine. That's it. And it was a. It was just a. Um, a scrivener's a, error. A scrivener's error. Yes. Exactly. All right. Very good. Yep. Make good job. Make motion to. Uh, I mean, entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Call the roll, please. I'm sorry. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Mr. Long. Yes. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Burns. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Okay. We are no longer entertaining the resolution 2823. That's been removed. We're on 7B. 7B and 7C are both quasi-judicial hearings. So I'm going to read the quasi-judicial hearing instructions into the record. This hearing shall be conducted in accordance with quasi-judicial rules. The applicant and the city shall be allowed 20 minutes each to present their mm -hmm. case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a maximum of six minutes if the person represents an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. The city staff and the applicant may be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant will be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not be legally made upon personal views as to whether a project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based on the numbers of citizens who support or oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the requirements of law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. If there is anybody here that is going to be speaking on resolution 73-23 or resolution 91-23, both A, um, on the agenda as 7B or 7C, please stand and be sworn in. Great. Please raise your right hand. By the authority vested in me as a notary of the state of Florida, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Okay, moving on to resolution number 73-23. Um, this is uh, the overhead doors face. This is the, um, the parcel that we, I think, s discussed, if I'm not mistaken. That's not Galaxy Marble, is it? Oh, it That's is. exactly right. Okay, it's Galaxy Marble then. Um, to the commission, any ex parte disclosure that needs to be made. Let's go down from uh, the deputy vice mayor. None. 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 Okay. So at this point, we're going to enter the project file into the record. Uh, good evening, Anthea Genotis for Development Services. I'd like to enter file number 2022-241 into the record, and the applicant is here with a brief presentation of their request. Very good. You've got the floor. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexandra Smith from Ken Carlson Architect. Um, I'm here to represent Galaxy Marble. We are requesting a relief waiver for the overhead door in the rear of the property. Um, that is actually the front view, right? Yeah. Now, just so you guys can see. Um, Galaxy Marble is an already established uh, marble supplier, but currently in Pompano Beach, but moving over to here. Um, that is the view from the Congress site. It's a vacant lot currently. Um, if you can go to the slide. Um, that's the, this is the parcel right in the center there. Um, it is, uh, as I said, a through site, so the, it's on one side Congress Avenue, the other side Northwest 18th Avenue. It's just north of Atlantic Avenue. Those are just the existing conditions of the front site right now. It's overgrown, and I think this will be a great new addition of this good-looking building there. This is the side that we're going to need the um, waiver for. This is off 18th Avenue. Um, it's a much smaller street, very industrial kind of area back there. Um, let's see that. Since it's vacant, the only there are no neighbors on either side. This is the only neighbor, um, also very industrial, so they'll be the only one really affected by the door view there. 
Um, so now moving to the design. The reason we actually need the waiver is because that site, as you can see, is very long and skinny. So no matter how we tried to put the building, there was no way to get the loading on the side. So we did try to take every step possible to mitigate any impact it would have to the surrounding um, neighbors and to the public. Um, as you can see, the building set back much further than the required 25 feet. We are set back about 130 feet. Um, and in addition, the landscape island, we strategically placed the vegetation to help sh uh, screen the overhead door from the view. Also, we do have a whole perimeter wall as well as a sliding gate that will be, um, it will be open during business hours, but at night it will be, or after business hours, it will be closed. So I have a few different views here of it. Um, it's really hard to even actually see, so you can, if you don't even see it back in there. It's, it's pretty well hidden as it is. Um, that's where the gate closed. Once the gate's closed, you really can't see it at all. This is looking from the other gate, it is a two entrance in the back, so that's from the other gate. Again, very far back in there, hard to see. And when you close the gate, again, completely gone. Any questions? We'll get back to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let the uh, staff go ahead and do their presentation. OK. Um, I'll just put a couple things on the record. I actually think it's a fairly straightforward request. I guess I'll get. I can't see you in the new table. <laughs> it's kind of hard. I got it, Darcy. OK. So, um, so this is Resolution 7323, and it is a waiver to allow overhead doors facing a public right-of-way. Um, the property um, has a double frontage. The front is, is on North Congress, and the back is on Northwest 18th. Um, it is in the Commerce District in the MIC area, which um, is one of the few areas in the city that allows industrial types of uses. And um, you know, this is um, a business relocating into the city. Um, so uh, it is a long, uh, sort of narrow site, um, and it is a, the proposal is to build a one-story warehouse with an office. And this is the arrangement. This side is Congress, um, where you can see the customer parking and the entry that was on the rendering that you saw at the beginning of the applicant's presentation. The setback of the, of the door from the rear or from the Northwest 18th Avenue side is 128 feet. There's um, parking. Um, again, a fence, landscaping, other things. Um, the property is only 98 feet wide, which makes it difficult to achieve um, loading and unloading on the side, on the interior setbacks. So again, this is the view from the main um, or the frontward facing part of the business facing Congress. The overhead doors um, would face the, the less intense road. Um, it is surrounded by um, MIC zoning with existing warehouse and outside storage as depicted in the applicant's um, presentation. The functions of the storage and loading will be inside the new building. Um, this is an elevation. Um, the, the door is this piece here. It's only 12 feet wide, so it's not, it's not you know, a series of doors or, you know, and, and again, it is largely shielded from the landscaping and the perimeter wall and fence that is um, proposed. Um, this is a unique waiver. Um, we haven't had one of these before that we could find in our records. Um, however, the, the surrounding neighborhood things to consider is, is established with these types of industrial uses, um, the shielding that is presented. And ultimately, um, if you decide to approve or deny, it should be based on the findings for a waiver that it won't have an adverse effect, that it's not going to affect um, a public facility or create an unsafe situation, and it's not a special privilege. Um, and that concludes my presentation. Very good. So at this point in time, we're going to invite anybody from the public who would like to speak to this issue. This would be your time. And seeing no one moving, I will close the public comment portion of this. Um, agenda item and go back to the applicant and to the staff asking if there's any cross-examination or rebuttal testimony. None. None. Okay, to the commission. Entertain a motion. It's actually good timing, interesting timing. Were you yes, here we for were our, just talking were you here about for our workshop earlier. at 3 No, I was not. No? It's all about Congress Avenue. Yeah, and I won't, I won't. You're what we're looking for. <laughs> 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 I don't think you're gonna have any problems up here. No. Um, yeah, and actually, your building looks beautiful too. Oh, thank you, you so are. much. Yeah, awesome. this is this is exactly what we should be doing. We should Great. be uh, assisting businesses just like yours that want to go 
just in that location. So, yep. mm -hmm. so is, is, uh, are you moving from Pompano or are you opening up a second store? We are actually the architect for it, but Galaxy is um, I'm moving from Pompano into Delray. Well, tell them welcome to Delray. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Long? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Burns? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Congratulations. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Have a great night. All right, you too. All right, we're on to 7C, which is Resolution 91-23. This is a Brick Tops Restaurant. Let me start by asking um, for any ex parte communication. Vice Mayor? Yes, I had a conversation with uh, Mr. Schiller. Yes, I was contacted by the registered agent. Okay, I don't have any unless it's in, on the server. I spoke to Mr. Schiller. Same, spoke to Mr. Schiller as well. All right, very good. So um, at this point, we're going to have the... Uh, Staff, go ahead and enter the project file into the record. Uh, good evening. The project file is for the Class 5 site plan that includes this request. The file number is 2022-300. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Schiller is here for the presentation. Very good. All yours. Good evening. Good evening. Neil Schiller, Government Law Group, uh, 137 Northwest 1st Avenue here in Delray Beach, Florida. I'm here tonight proudly representing Brick Tops, hopefully a new addition to the city of Delray Beach. And along with, along with me is my uh, sidekick, Jeff Costello, uh, planner extraordinaire. Uh, our request tonight is uh, in-lieu parking for Brick Tops Restaurant. We were one of the four uh, applications that was in the process and in the system uh, before you passed your zoning in progress last week. Uh, we're seeking to buy nine spaces for in-lieu parking, which generates about 213,000 in fees. Uh, we're required 30 spaces overall for the 5,000 square foot restaurant. 21 of those 30 spaces will be provided on site. This is the aerial of the property on uh, Atlantic Avenue and Northeast 5th, where just a, a block, uh, two blocks north, um, just north of the popcorn house, which uh, is obviously going to stay and we sell, be celebrated. Uh, West End Restaurants is the owner manager of Brick Tops. They have 10 current locations, eight Brick Tops, two River House. Uh, the closest one is Palm Beach, which I uh, tested gladly on Saturday for brunch. And I have to say the, the menu was great and the service was great. The food was, was even better. Uh, they also have two restaurants called The River House, one in Palm Beach Gardens and one in Nashville. So this is a real restaurant operator, formerly of Houston's. Uh, the people like to say this is an elevated Houston's menu, and, and it really is. Uh, I will get to the reason why they, I don't know why it's called Brick Tops, uh, but I will find out the owner. I haven't had a chance to ask him yet. This is a rendering of, of what we're proposing to to eventually build. Uh, wide sidewalks will be subject to a sidewalk cafe permit coming in the future, and there is a waiver for tinted glass coming uh, before you in the future. It's just an elevation, not that you guys should be considering any of this. Um, the site plan, this just for your information, is 5,000 square feet, indoor and outdoor. Um, again, 21 on-site parking spaces. You can see where they are going to be with uh, nine that we're seeking in lieu for. Uh, there are findings that you have to make for in-lieu parking. As you know, uh, our request uh, is consistent with the LDRs, the Comprehensive Plan, Parking, and Curbside Management Plan. The property, as you know, is also in the central core of the CBD where a lot of parking options are available. Uber and Lyft has increased, as has Freebie and other multi-modes of transportation. This is just an area, uh, an aerial where you can see available parking spaces. Um, so there's a lot of parking in our downtown, uh, not necessarily owned by the city or the CRA, but is available for the public to park. Uh, we believe uh, that we meet all the criteria for you to approve tonight. Uh, again, we're seeking nine uh, spaces. 21 will be provided on site. Uh, the DDA recommended approval at their meeting and the Parking Management Advisory Board recommended approval at theirs. We asked for your approval tonight and are here to answer any questions. Very good, thank you.
Okay, so Anthea Genetics Development Services um, Director. Um, so uh, the property uh, in question is this is the existing building. Um, and you can see that its orientation along Federal is um, half of the property has the building and then there's a side parking lot. Um, this is um, in the central business district, um, the central core sub, sub district. Um, so there's an existing two story, 7,000 square foot uh, building with um, retail on the ground floor and, and there's an office above. Um, and the proposal is to remove the building in its entirety and build, entirety and build about a 5,000 square foot restaurant. Um, what is starting to move through the process, just to put it on the record, is the Atlantic Avenue um, Resource Survey and Historic um, Evaluation. This building was identified as a contributor. So, a potential contributor. Um, so if the building is removed, the code then uh, requires the new building to set back a bit further than the current building is positioned, um, creating a wider sidewalk area with trees and uh, room for um, outdoor dining. Uh, the building then extends, it lines the sidewalk and the parking all moves to the back instead of being positioned on the side. This is all going to be considered under the class five site plan, but just so you, you, know, you can see, I, I oriented the plan, they're not facing north, but just so you can see, uh, that's the existing building and the new building will extend along the front. Um, so again, uh, the request is for nine in lieu spaces. Um, the project um, is required to provide 30 spaces to, for parking the restaurant and they have achieved 21 on site in addition to some loading areas and other things that need to, to work for the restaurant. Um, it's largely um, accessed through the alley system in the back. Um, so that's here. Um, INLU allows a maximum, the current LDR allows new construction under the current rules to use 30% of the required parking to an INLU situation. So this is maximizing that 30%. If you were doing adaptive reuse in, in an existing building, then there is a, a higher ability. Um, and I'm just considering what we're thinking about within lieu, I just want to be sure I'm giving you an overall view for other considerations in addition to just this one. Um, so again, this is the rendering of the building. The building was submitted before um, the ordinance that's coming along later um, in a more, I think, um, can, uh, an execution of Art Deco that is more consistent with the city's history, which we'll talk about later. So. Um, and again, what you can see with the, the existing building, I want to say, is, is about here on where you see the change in the pavement and the new building steps back. And that allows room for additional street trees and the sidewalk cafe in the front. Um, achieving the sidewalk cafe will require an update to our lease with DOT, so um, just making sure that's okay um, moving forward if the in lieu is approved. Um, and again, the, the, uh, for this request, um, the payment structure is based on the geographical location and the adopted fees. Um, and in this case, uh, the, um, the, re the requirement is uh, just over 23,000 per space. And the determination has to be that there is adequate uh, public parking available in the area. Um, there are public garages as well as on street parking in multiple locations along multiple corridors. Um, this request was reviewed by the DDA um, on April 10th and there was a recommendation to approval and it was also reviewed by the Parking Management Advisory Board in April with another recommendation of approval. <coughs> here if you have any questions. Very good. This is another one of our quasi-judicial hearings so if there's anybody here that would like to speak to this issue. Please step forward, state your name and address, and you'll have three minutes. Seeing no one, public comment is closed. We'll go back to the applicant and the staff. Is there any cross-examination or rebuttal testimony? No, ma'am. All right, to the commission. I guess we're gonna have a few more of these. Um, so it meets the current criteria under the current rules um, until we change it, so I'll be in favor. Anything else? I. I it just kills me to lose the, the building because it is something that when you drive by it, you recognize, you know, it's been there longer than you have been here. So anyway, <laughs> um, but it is what progress, ha what happens with progress and uh, um, is what it is. 
Um, anything else? Entertain a motion. I have a question. Oh, yeah, sure. Aren't you, in fact, his sidekick? <laughs> wow. That is true. Okay. Motion to approve. <laughs> Second. Oh. Oh, no, go ahead. Second. Second for discussion. Well, no, I just have a question about the in lieu fees. I am just fascinated by this in lieu, lieu fees. So are these funds earmarked for a future parking lot someplace or a parking garage? That's, that's a good question, and I think it's a good one for a uh, future uh, workshop. But, yeah, we'll, we'll probably. But well, yeah. it hasn't been yet. We have uh, not. Okay. Yeah, meanwhile, it simply goes into the parking trust fund. Mm -hmm. It's just a big fund. So, I, if I may, Madam Mayor, June 13th, we made a commitment for that workshop meeting to be exclusively dedicated to the budget process. We'll touch on some of the goal setting outcomes that occurred this past Friday as a function of that. And that will be one of the footnotes. It will be an overall education as well as an opportunity for the illustrious Derry Beach City Commission to offer its thoughts and direction in that regard. So with that, more to come. Nevertheless, here we are. All right, just fascinating. Okay, so we had a, a, a motion, but I, did we have a second by somebody? Yes? I second it for this. Okay, second. very good. All right, so call the roll. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Burns? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Thank you. All right, guys, good luck. All right, moving on to 7E. We already discussed 7D as 7 AAA. 7E is now going to be the nomination for the appointment to the Board of Adjustments. We start with Mr. Boylston. Yes, there is a whopping two choices. Oh, and I'll go, go with Ms. Cullinan. Second. Cullinan. Any discussion? Call the roll. Ms. Burns. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Mr. Long. Yes. Mr. Boylston. Yes. Commissioner Burns, you have the second uh, pick and uh, the final pick. To this same board? Yes. Okay, th then I go with the last and final choice. <laughs> Could you call, call the name out? <laughs> yes, it's oh, William, uh, somebody help me with the last, I don't want to mess up. Shoulder, sir. Shoulder, sir, okay. Second. Call the roll, please. Oh, well, call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Mr. Bolson? Yes. Ms. Burns. Yes. All right, moving on to 7F, which is nomination to the Affordable Housing Advisory Board. This would be Mr. Long. I'd like to nominate Myra Plant. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the roll. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Mr. Long. Yes. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Burns. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Okay, moving on to 7G, which is resolution 103-23. Ms. Jellin. Um, this is just a, the memorialization of the Commission's direction at the last meeting to reaffirm that the City Commission is going to be the, is going to comprise the CRA and to uh, have it as a five-member board. Okay. Motion so. to approve Resolution 103-23. Second. Second. Call, the, call the roll, please. Mr. Long? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Burns? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? No. Mr. Frankel. Yes. All right, very good. Moving on to public hearings and second readings, ordinance number 12-23. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development regulations of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Delray Beach by amending Chapter 4, Zoning Regulations, Article 4.4, .4, Base Zoning District, Section 4.4.13, Central Business, CBD District, Subsection F, Architectural Standards, to require City Commission approval for the use of masonry, mo masonry modern and art deco architectural styles, Prior to site plan approval, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, authority to codify, providing an effective date, and for other purposes, this is second reading. Ms. Gianna, let's, we got a nice presentation for this one. <laughs> I, I, I hope so. Um, okay, so uh, we, uh, in the downtown, uh, the Central Business District has um, architectural design guidelines that have been adopted. Um, and what's before you tonight is not actually to take any out or remove them, although we received some direction to update some of the images, which we're working on. We'll bring back to you by resolution. Um, and um, ultimately, uh, the request is more related to process in order, I think the intent is to elevate the execution of two styles than what we've been seeing downtown. So um, the guidelines provide uh, basic instruction related to composition, building articulation, storefront balconies, and identify seven styles that are sort of expected in downtown um, based on historical precedent, our climate, um, and the building scale that we have in the downtown area. Um, one of them is uh, Main Street Vernacular. Um, 
The others are uh, a Florida vernacular execution, Anglo-Caribbean uh, Mediterranean revival, Art Deco, the classical tradition, and masonry modern. Uh, the definition of these styles is purposely broad. Um, they do capture, whereas for example in our historic districts there's very uh, big distinctions between, or there's, there are distinctions between uh, the executions of different periods um, and, and decades and things. These sort of capture a larger um, amount of them to provide more flexibility um, you know, to, to developers and architects that are designing in the city. Um, just because it's not listed doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means if something is coming along that is maybe not as consistent by with the village by the sea that we're expecting to, to, um, to uh, realize, um, then um, it moves through an extra board, which means um, SPRAB or HPB, depending on the property, uh, makes a recommendation, and ultimately the city commission reviews it again. This is really meant to provide a little bit more public input when it's something that departs. Um, the Ray Hotel uh, used this um, avenue to do the floating box and um, the, uh, the, the more modern uh, metal cladding that you see on that building. So um, there it is. So these are kind of what was explained and how it moved through so that we had an understanding of how it would be executed. Um, so the two that have come to, to risen to this level of concern are masonry modern, which I think has been just the most prolific type of architecture we're seeing in downtown, but also throughout the city, keeping in mind that Sprab sees more than downtown. They see all of what is coming in. Um, and then there's been concern about the execution of Art Deco. Um, we have, uh, I found, <laughs> since we last talked, uh, we found this book in our offices, which was about a book published about Art Deco of the Palm Beaches, and there is an entire section on Delray Beach, and this building at the end of Atlantic Avenue is actually showcased as one of the examples, and it's still there today. So you can see that what we've had historically is a more simple version of Art Deco, so this goes to possibly <laughs> updating our design guidelines a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but but when the guidelines were drafted, um, there were already approvals that were moving through that had this style. And the local architect that um, particularly implemented this style for the time being did a little bit more of an exaggerated version of Art Deco. And perhaps that's what the community is sort of responding to. Um, and then Masonry Modern, which um, I think has started to be viewed as um, sometimes it's well executed with a lot of wood detailing or other things, and other times it looks like perhaps it's just um, a way to do very inexpensive, simple detailing. So I think that's been the concern. Um, not picking on either of these buildings, I think actually as the Hampton is coming out of the ground, what you're going to see is very wide sidewalks, wonderful street trees, there's an open space relief, things like that. But again, these are the two that have given, I think, the most consternation to the community. So we can't say that you don't do them, but then the, the idea is to adjust the process. So um, what is in the ordinance would basically require, instead of just final action by SPRAB, it would go from SPRAB uh, to this board, and, and that would be the way that it would move through the process, so an extra public hearing. Um, there are several uh, you know, policies related to this concern, one of which is um, the objective NDC 2.2, which strives to protect and enhance the village by the sea character of the downtown and the neighborhoods located east of 95, and then others about um, you know, form and quality, and then reviewing and updating LDRs, but also streamlining. And so this is not streamlining, this is more reacting, I think, to a concern about the execution of the other objective. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Board reviewed this ordinance on March 20th and voted unanimously to recommend approval. I'm here if you have any questions. To the commission? No. No. Public hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. This is public hearing. If there's anybody that wants to speak to um, the ordinance that we just spoke about, 12-23, please step forward, state your name and address, and you'll have three minutes. Seeing no one, public comment is closed to the commission. Yes, sir. Let's start us off. Sure, um, and you know, perhaps I'm missing some context here, but um, you know, 
I feel like we've done some things as a board, even since I've been on, that have helped streamlined things for that will eventually help streamline things for planning and zoning and SPRAB. We're talking about doing some things to that effect, which I think is great. This seems like a step backwards to me. It feels like we're cherry picking two of our architectural approved architectural styles and then adding in an additional he approval hearing. In my mind, we should either remove those as approved architectural styles if they don't fit in our city anymore or we should trust the, the board, the SPRAB that we appoint to be able to make those decisions about these styles. So, and, and you know, I'm, I wanna hear what my colleagues have to say because I could be missing some of the context here, but for me, this, this isn't something that at face value I, I agree with. Vice Mayor. Um, I definitely see your concerns. And obviously we're making a lot of changes to um, streamline things and this does seem, seem the opposite of that. We've had conversations, and it's not so much that we just picked out these two. And actually, I, I asked staff, like, how do we objectively have this conversation? And depending on the, the timing, you might pick an architectural style that's starting to saturate your city. And today, it's these styles. But 20 years ago, it would have been other styles. And so how do, what, what can we put in place without getting rid of them, without deleting them, still leaving them as an option? how can we incentivize to maybe choose some of the other ones so that it's diverse, or our architectural style is diverse? Because really, we're just seeing so many choose these two, right? And it might be, it might have to do with the financial aspects of these two options, right? Um, and I thought staff came up with a, no, no one wants an extra step, right? Right. Right, even we don't want the extra step. Um, so I thought it was a really clever idea to say, yeah, you can still choose these, but there's gonna be an extra step. I'm hoping people don't choose that extra step. I'm hoping that steers people to some of these other styles, which we rarely, rarely ever see. Like I've been up here five years, there's a few of those styles that I've never seen. Um, and so we're just- as a deterrent, to, more or less? Exactly, yeah, yeah. An incentive to off to of choose sway, yeah, sway one of the other sure. five. I, I would like to put it right An incentive to choose one of the other five I think is that so we, we had we did have the discussion and uh, and I got to give staff credit I think it's pretty clever and I and uh, I, I look forward to measuring it right and, and seeing if it works so and if I can piggyback not just uh, incentivize but also if they choose one or these other styles that we will have the opportunity of saying yeah that's just way too plain Jane add some things to it to be able to make it look better and we're good with it because what's happening is, is we're seeing kind of a boxy with very little, you know, anything going on it because of maybe the cost function, but you're already doing a box or really outlandish kind of change uh, of the, the art deco that doesn't really say Delray Beach. It might say South Miami at some way, you know, back in time, you know, era. So what we'd like to do is, those are the two that we have received the most responses from the community on, and it was over and over, so that's one of the reasons why we're here, um, because of what we're receiving, and also how we could possibly kind of sli you know, slightly lean into maybe some of the other styles. Yeah. Sure. <coughs> have a question. Yeah, sure. I don't know if it's Lynn or Anthea who would be the best person to answer. Um, with the potential accommodation in the future, we're going to discuss with SPRAB and PNC. I see here that you know it specifically says SPRAB. It specifically says Historic Board. Would that have an effect if we take certain actions in the future? Okay, just want to make sure. All right, thanks for the presentation. All right, so if there's no other questions or concerns, let's motion go. to approve. Go. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Burns. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Mr. Long. Yes. Okay, moving on. I don't love it, but see. It, it probably like won't be, hopefully it won't be any work. Okay, right, maybe that, you see what I'm saying? You know, maybe this isn't going to work out, so it's no work for us. All right, extra work, I should say. Ordinance number 13-23. Uh, An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development regulations of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Delray Beach by amending Chapter 2, Administrative Provisions, Article 2.2, .2, Establishment of Boards, Having responsibilities for land development regulations, section 2.2.3, the site plan review and appearance board, to reduce the meeting requirement from two meetings per month to one meeting per month and to update language.
clarity, providing a conflict clause, a severability clause, authority to codify, providing an effective date, and further purposes. And this to a second reading. So this was an ordinance that was underway before um, the direction to seek to uh, more aggressively streamline. But um, just to finish this one off in the it's meantime, me. though, <laughs> just to make it official that SPRAB is once a month. Um, we do occasionally hold more depending on the volume of applications, um, and that would not change. But um, right now we're operating under special permission by the manager, and it would just be better if the LDRs reflected it. Thank you. Any questions, concerns? Public hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you again. Um, any concerns or, or any questions <laughs> from the public that would like to speak up and to speak to ordinance number 13-23, please step forward and state your comments now. Seeing no one, public comment is closed to the commission. I think we're good, so. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Spurns? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. And Ordinance 18-23. The Ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delaware Beach, Florida, many of the Code of Ordinance Code of Ordinances, Title V, Public Works, Chapter 56, Stormwater, General Provisions by Amending Chapter Sec Amending Section 56.03, Findings and Determinations to Modify the Intent of Stormwater Management Assessments to Fund the Stormwater Management System Enterprise Fund and to amend the basis for stormwater assessments to a tier based system for residential properties. By amending Section 56.04, Definitions to Update Definitions to be Consistent with the New Bases for Stormwater Assessments. By amending Section 56.15, Position of stormwater management assessment classification and criteria to clarify that assessments will be applied to develop properties and to remove references to the per acreage assessment system. By amending section 56.16, establishment of rate for stormwater management assessments to oops, repeal the existing per acreage stormwater management assessment system to adopt a tier based system, tier based stormwater management assessment system for residential properties and to delete discounts for property located within the Lakeward drain, Drainage District and property with privately maintained drainage systems. By many, Section 56.17, Adjustment of Stormwater Management Assessments to update references from the Environmental Services Department to Public Works, delete language requiring consideration for retention facilities for owner-initiated adjustments, remove discount eligibility for property with private drainage facilities, and delete language authorizing the city to inspect private drainage facilities. By amending section 56.20, private facilities to clarify responsibilities related to maintenance and operations and inspections on private property. And by amending section 56.23, stormwater assessment process to provide authorization to establish reserves and to require the preparation of a stormwater management assessment role annually, providing a conflicts clause, providing a severability clause, authority to codify, and providing an effective date. This is also a second hearing. Okay. Ms. Barletto. Thanks, Lynn. You're welcome. My pleasure. You said it all for yeah. I did it. All she has to say is This is why they don't let me bring many ordinance for Exactly. <laughs> okay, so I have a very short presentation for you this evening just to remind you of the presentation that we gave mm -hmm. at the workshop on April 18th. This is the the final reading of the ordinance that puts the provisions that you voted on or you gave consensus for earlier into action. So the reason that we are doing a new stormwater rate structure is to address the city's stormwater obligations and customer needs, to reflect current program needs, um, to give the city defensible po policies for how we implement stormwater utility assessments to the general public and um, to provide a sustainable and dedicating fun dedicated funding source for stormwater management, which is what we use to address the issues with climate change you heard about earlier in the Office of Sustain Sustainability's presentation. Um, the new rate structure, um, it eliminates some previous stormwater discounts and exemptions that we, that we had in place previously. Um, some of those were for people who were within the Lake Worth Drainage District, which um, didn't preclude the city from performing stormwater maintenance activities within their areas. It just gave them a discount on the on the um, on the.
Oh. It's Nancy.